I just want to welcome everybody to the library and thank you for coming. There's a lot of competition on this Columbus Day weekend, yes. I'll tell you, yes. between the fair going on and the parade. So um, keep that in mind, but I don't think you'll have to worry about being you know, trapped here at the library because of the parade going by. The parade is today, right? Yes. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. It's at 3.30. 3.30. Okay. We've got plenty of time, the time then. Is good. Plenty of time. I was telling Dick before, we had a lot of people calling the library that were upset they couldn't make today's um, presentation, but we're taping it. So that won't be a problem, and hopefully we'll get it on our library YouTube channel. So I don't think I have to give a big introduction. Well, for the Dick. YouTube channel, that's great. Yeah, I think that's what we're going to do. Yeah, that's good. Uh, everyone knows Dick. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. Town historian. Who knows more about East Chester than Dick Forleano? I'm not. I'm not sure there is anyone. And he's already talking to me about next year's program. I want you to know. <laughs> We're already making plans. <laughs> Nobody alive knows as much about East Chester. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there's, some, there's some people who aren't here anymore. That I've learned a lot from. Um, and I, I'm going to turn it over to you. I know you're going to learn some really interesting, interesting things you probably didn't know. I always do with Dick's presentation. So, ladies and gentlemen, Dick Forleano. Somebody came up to me and said, we have days for everybody. Uh, uh, you, know, you have Martin Luther King Day, uh, you have uh, months, Women's History Months, Black History Months, uh, and then there's Columbus Day. And uh, she was concerned about teaching about Italians in the public school. We have a great uh, Italian program up at Eastchester. I'm pretty sure they have a good one in Tuckahoe. Uh, but he said, why don't they have, we'll pay more attention to uh, Columbus Day. So this presentation, is, as you see up here, is entitled Italian Americans in East Chester and the Celebration of Columbus Day. Uh, for the last hundred years, the largest ethnic group in East Chester is Italian. One third. The other group that comes in second place are the Irish, and then there's the other 49%. Um, so this is going to, this presentation is about the connection between Columbus Day and uh, people of Italian blood uh, who lived in East Chester for that, over that hundred years. Now, why was Columbus Day set up? Um, in 1937, yeah, yeah. In 1937, Congress passed a law making Columbus Day a national holiday because for the last 50 years, people who were Italian and their descendants were victims of discrimination in one form or another. That, uh, to most of us, is a distant memory today. But when Roosevelt signed that law, it was a painful memory. Next slide. In 1911, as you see, go, no, go one back. 11 Italian, Italian immigrants were lynched in New Orleans before their trial. Uh, now, uh, we have uh, Lynchings, you know, if you were African American, that was common uh, sense of repression for decades. <clears throat> but the, you didn't have many lynchings of Italians, but their form of discrimination was different and it was continuous. Um, as late as 1927, you've all heard of Sacco and Vanzetti. Uh, most historians unanimous that one of those men who were executed was definitely innocent. And the other one was his, his guilt was questionable. The event happened in 1921. Uh, we hear of anarchists today. There was an anarchist attack because they were Italian and they had belonged to an anarchist organization. They were put in trial, many appeals, and this took uh, six years before they were eventually uh, executed with the electric chair. Uh, but the forms of discrimination against Italians were much more subtle. Um, most of you know ex-mayor, the late 
ex-mayor Phil White. I mean, just raise your hand if you remember him. He was, he was a great guy. We used to do tours forever. Phil, the name of Phil White's father was Jack Bianchi. He moved to Tuckahoe in 1921. And his dad couldn't get a job. So his dad uh, changed his name. Who knows what Bianchi means in Italian? White. White. Changed his name to <laughs> Phil White. So his name is Phil White. His older brother, Frank Bianco, Bianco, was a coach on the only Little League team to ever go to the World Series. And Phil wasn't ashamed of being Italian, but he had to keep the name he was given on his birth certificate. And I, I love telling him, so there was discrimination in not subtle ways, in obvious ways. If you were Italian and you applied for a job, there's a good chance you wouldn't get it. Like Frank Bianco, he didn't, I mean, uh, Jack Bianco, he had to uh, change his name. If you were Italian, and, and the jobs, it wasn't like when the Irish first came, there were plenty of jobs in the quarries or at Hodgman Rubber, but jobs were harder to come by. So many of the Italians worked for less. Now, we have to understand what Italy was like. The great wave of Italian immigrations started in the 1890s. That's when my great-grandfather came in. Now, what the part of Italy did he come from? Most of the Italians, my son Tom is here, uh, uh, came from uh, uh, southern Italy because you had a choice at this time. There were volcanoes, there were earthquakes, there was drought, there was persecution from those northern Italians. And you had a choice if you wanted to support your family, leave in a boat or leave in a coffin. And many left in boats, but it was different. The Italians came, it was the men first, and then if they could, they brought the women, and if they, or they made enough money, and they went back home to take care of their families. There was a wave of Italian immigration at this time. But um, um, often it was said, don't date an Italian from other groups. So there were all kinds of, um, and unlike, Tuckahoe was the exception. There's no room for separate neighborhoods in Tucko. You're all crowded together around Depot Square. So there were no ghettos, no separate neighborhoods. So the Italians, the Irish, the Germans, they all lived in a, uh, well, in the 20s it wasn't Harmony, and later on became Harmony, which I'll go to next. Next picture. <clears throat> but uh, prejudice isn't the only reason we celebrate Columbus Day. Uh, I need my pointer. Oh, here it is. <laughs> it's in my pocket. So that people say, where are your glasses? They're on your head. Okay. Uh, we have Columbus Day. The more important today is there's something called the Columbian Exchange. As a result of Columbus's voyage, now I'll talk to you a little bit about who Columbus actually was and what he wasn't. But because of, uh, before Columbus, there were people here before. You know about the Vikings? Mm -hmm. Before the Vikings, there was an Irish, St. Brendan came here, uh, and they lived here, but they didn't stay because the European takeover, which I'll get to next, of the Western Hemisphere started with Columbus. Now, Columbus didn't know what he had done. He didn't know the true size of the Earth, he didn't know he had come, discovered two new continents that would come later on. Uh, and he was out to find a new way to the Indies. And he thought this, what they call this, the West Indies. He made a lot of mistakes. Also, don't judge people uh, from the 21st century. Judge them from the context of the times in which they lived. This was a man who risked everything. Uh, his crew, he got the lower dregs of Spanish society, filled up his boat, and he came in contact with Native Americans. And the first Native Americans he came into contact with the Tainos. Uh, and uh, at first it was a, a love fest. The Indians gave him whatever he wanted. He was very kind, but his crew took advantage of them. And eventually, uh, disease, uh, fighting, um, looking for, there was, they had, tickets of gold, um, it, it ended up in a uh, 
ugly, ugly warfare. But, and this is going to be very important, Columbus made four voyages, and on each voyage he brought a Catholic priest. On his last voyage, he brought a priest named Bartholomew de la Casas. Don't, I hope we don't have any Spanish teachers here, because my pronunciation is terrible. And he looked at the situation and he said, my goodness, we're supposed to bring religion to America. And look how these poor Native Americans are being treated. So the, the La Casas goes back to Spain and he gets the king and queen of Spain, Isabel, um, Ferdinand and Isabella, to ban the enslavement of Native Americans. There are more people of Native American blood in the places colonized by the Spanish Catholics than when they first came. And that's important to remember. Columbus, but he started something. Now, what, what happened as a result of his discovery? Uh, from Europe came uh, wheat, cows, horses. That's all great. It really helped the people who lived here. There were no horses on the Great Plains and the wild stallions. But they also brought firearms, guns, and they also brought diseases. It was diseases that killed most of them. They had no immunity. This is called the Columbian Exchange. And vice versa, um, potatoes didn't come from Ireland. They came from Peru. Tomatoes, pizza, came from America. So we call this the Columbian Exchange. And that's, uh, and we should really celebrate this because this changed world history. And if Columbus, even though he didn't know what he had done, it was after Columbus that this all took place. Next slide. Next slide. Lisa, next slide. Isn't that the next one? Yeah. <clears throat> now, um, if you look, so this was from San Francisco where you had the first uh, St. Uh, St. Patrick's Day, you won't get the Columbus Day Parade in 1866, all the way down to, the, uh, to South America were colonized by the Spanish. Now, the, hi Larry. Uh, <laughs> uh, now the Incas and the Aztecs, and before then the Mayans had an advanced civilization. But let us not forget that while they had, they did brain surgery in the Incas, and they had a system of roads better than the roads we had today, there were negative aspects to these civilizations. Cannibalism, um, human sacrifice. Um, so the Spanish who followed Columbus were involved in a ghastly war against them. But eventually it was settled, missions were set up, and in this part from San Francisco, Southwest, Central America, the West Indies, South America, there, there's a greater uh, population. Now, uh, I'm very proud to be an American, but uh, the, the British, uh, they felt that their way was the only way, and uh, uh, some very negative things happened. Mm -hmm. But if we really want to talk about the, our kids, uh, when I went to school, I learned about Western civilization. It all started with Egypt, a little bit of China, Greece, Rome, the Middle Ages, uh, feudalism, and then Columbus. But there's a whole aspect of history that we should be aware of. But this is important. It's all in the Bible. It is all in the Bible. Next slide. Now, uh, oh, I'm going to stop here. Does anybody anybody want to make any comments about um, anything that I've talked about so far? Any questions? A big bunch of Italians also came from different parts of Italy into the United States. Yeah. Not only in New York, they, a lot of them came into Boston. And yeah. you were quite right about men coming first. Then after men came, they got permission that they were sponsored to bring their wives and their families over into the United States. That wasn't always a guarantee when they went into New York or Boston. 
because immigration officers at that time were quite prejudiced towards the Italians coming into the United States back then. They didn't pass a lot of them. If it came with a cold or some sort of infection on your skin or a skin rash, you would deport it back to your native country. You weren't accepted back into the United States. It, it, it could be quite brutal in Ellis right. Island. Right. And your name was changed often. Right, your name was changed, your vows were shortened. You know, um, some people were called, say, Parisi, they were called Paris. Some people were called Passarelli, they were called Pass. This names were shortened. They didn't go on and use their name, but they used the name that the Americans felt were easier to spell for them. And a lot of those people that came from the other side, when they say the other side from Europe, came to the United States. They were, like you said, were hard to find jobs. And they were called the pick and shovel workers, the now, Italians. The prejudice um, was really ugly. Right. Now, take the word WAP. You've all heard that word. Right. Um, you know, when I went to high school, we would kid, kid, kid each other about it. Right. But back then, it was, it was you know what WAP stands for? Without papers. Without papers. Right. You know, you know what a, a day go is? A day laborer. Right. Now, I'm not sure what a guinea means, but my father, if you called him a guinea, would get very upset. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was painful. And uh, it was often said in the 20s, 30s, I don't want you marrying, and they use that. You're all, all aware of that ha happening. Oh, um, uh, I do have a great story I want to share with you. I brought my family here. My favorite group. My favorite granddaughter is here. Okay. Alexa Tavalilla Forliano. Alexa, I know we're embarrassed, but come up here. <laughs> You're gonna be on TV, Alexa. What's your mom's name? Brooke Tavalilla. Okay, uh, and you gotta talk loud because you're on, she's gonna kill me when I get home. <laughs> tell, tell East Chester about the story of the Tavalilla name. We gotta talk real loud. Doesn't it mean the little table? Yes, because the original Tavalilla lived in southern Italy, mm -hmm. and he was an orphan. And what you did, you put your or you take a baby, and somebody didn't want the original. I don't even know what his first name is, mm -hmm. uh, and, and put him on a table, <laughs> little table. And that, so that's why you're. A, that's what Tavalilla means in Italian. I heard that from your your uh, your grand uncle. Yeah. Okay. So are you, are you proud of me of putting you on TV? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alexa. How many grand motors you got? Uh, don't ask that question. <laughs> no, it's a joke. She's the only granddaughter. <laughs> she's the only one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but she's That's very why she's your favorite. Uh, but uh, um, and we're very close. Uh, okay. uh, I'm terrible with little babies. Um, when she was two years old, uh, um, I would put her on my shoulders. I had no idea what to do, so we used to go and look at cathedrals or churches, the old Immaculate, Concep Immaculate Conception Church. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one day I missed a seat and sat down and she started crying. But, uh, she was, the poor two-year-old was lying on the floor. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, but, uh, okay. Uh, now, um, this is a controversy that I'm not going to be able to answer. Mm -hmm. We've all the controversy. Um, some people want to do away with Columbus Day and mm -hmm. replace it with Indigenous People Day. Mm -hmm. um, something I just found out on Wednesday. There is an Indigenous People Day. I never knew about it. The UN worldwide has an Indigenous People Day on um, August 9th. They started that in 1982, which is interesting. Um, and. For the next year, uh, Tracy Wright was telling me, but I'm going to be studying this about the background to this. Should Indigenous History Day be shared with Columbus Day? Should it be a separate day? Uh, and the other thing, and I know this from, uh, I started teaching uh, social studies in 1966 and having stopped. Don't stereotype Native Americans. You talk about the Iroquois, they're very different from the Indians who lived here, and they're very different from the Aztecs and the Incas. So this is something that we have to really investigate. Um, but these two days are not 
mutually exclusive. The one thing I will say, don't do away with Columbus Day. Italians have the same right to have their heritage being celebrated as any other, or commemorated as any other group. So let's go to the next slide. Dick, did you want to do the Russell Shorto quote? That's the next slide. Oh, oh it's on, okay. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is one of my favorite books. Um, I cheat. I, a lot of time, well, I, I've read this book cover to cover. And this is my favorite quote from Russell Shorto, which I'm going to ask Lissa uh, to read to you. The indigenous, the indigenous people were as skilled, as duplicitous, and as capable of theological ruminations and technological cunning, as smart and pigheaded, and as curious and cruel as the Europeans who met them. They weren't any better or any worse. Uh, and, and each Native American group was different, but they shared certain common characteristics. And this really has to be investigated. Uh, this is a, if you want to read a good book on the Dutch and the English coming here, uh, Shorto's book is a classic in his study. And this is my favorite passage, because um, if the tables had been reversed, and the Native Americans had gone to Europe, would they have treated the Europeans any better than we treated them? Plus, the Spanish, when you talk about the Spanish and the Portuguese, the idea of human rights didn't even exist until about 100 years before the American Revolution. When did Columbus discover America? Everybody knows that date. What date, everybody? There was no idea of human rights. But the king of Spain, Fernando and Isabella, they stopped the enslavement of Native Americans. They set up missions. Um, they sent their priests to save their souls. Now, did they, did they kill a lot of the Native Americans? Did they make them second class citizens? Yes. But when you study, and this is what our kids are learning in school today, they're put, it's called global studies. It's no longer, well, what I took was world history. What you probably took was world history if you're over, uh, over 50. But global studies is very different. And it's all about identity, who you are, where you come, came from. And, um, and, it, and we're revolutionizing the way we're teaching history. Because when you go in there, you take a global studies course now, if you have the most up-to-date technology, not every school has that, and go back and trace your ethnic roots. Next slide. Now I'm over a little history of Columbus Day and the parade. I'll let you go early enough to get a good seat for the parade. Uh, 1968, first Columbus Day parade in the United States was in San Francisco. 1868. Oh, thank you. 1868. I knew that. I'm just. Well, I'll blame it on being. I don't look too nervous. But I know I'm not. There was a typo. Uh, no, it's 1868 is the right date, Mike. Uh, 1900. Now, that's a misleading statistic, and it shows how we've changed. Today, East Chester is inundated with apartment buildings. They didn't have any apartment buildings in the year 1900. What you had were boarding houses and not hotels like we have it today. And many of the Italians uh, stayed in boarding houses. They didn't show up to the census. They worked in the quarries. They worked, they did construction. They worked on, on the dams. And when they could, they found jobs. There were probably 400. By 1930, what started off as a trickle became a tidal wave of Italians moving. And where did they move to? Tuckahoe. Because that's where the train stopped. But there was a trolley that went from Tuckahoe to the north end of East Chester. You know what the north end of East Chester in Scarsdale used to be called? Upper Tuckahoe. And there was a real connection between the Italians in Tuckahoe and the Italians on the north end of East Chester. Uh, and um, <coughs> They came there, and they could travel back and forth by trolley. Then the automobile messed, messed that all up. And Upper Tuckahoe, eventually in 1958, uh, the name changed when East Chester got its own post office. 
Okay, I told a story back in um, the story of the Assumption Church and the Immaculate Conception Church. Um, the Irish controlled, and still to this day, control uh, a, a lot of the, the church, uh, the Roman Catholic Church. Italians moving in. Now, the present Immaculate Conception Church is on Winter Hill Road. Originally, up till 1911, it was in Waverly Square. And when Italians would come, there would have been Irish priests. And how, how does an Italian who can't speak English confess to an Irishman? And then they would go, and the Italians would want to go up to the service. And they said, no, you have to go down to the basement. So in 1911, guess what? The Italians, quarry workers, with their own hands, built their own church. And the very, in the summer of 1911, the same year that the Immaculate Conception Church was opened, building started for the Assumption Church. And it was built by Italian quarry workers going to the quarries with your present Assumption Church. And guess who mixed the mortar? Their wives. And, uh, um, and really, the Assumption, both churches are great. Now, you're saying, oh, how can the Irish be such a rotten people? Well, they weren't rotten people. This was, a pro this was done all over the country because the role of the church was to Americanize the immigrant. So they wanted to have an Italian speaking place and, 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 and another place where everybody could feel comfortable. Now they're closing a lot of Catholic, church, uh, Catholic schools today. Why? Because they built too many churches <laughs> back then. Um, but that doesn't, make, but the treatment, um, um, uh, you know, I've heard so many stories that if an, back then, not now, if an Irish person, um, if your Irish child dated an Italian child, they would disown you. Now what changed all that? Two things. Uh, one was the parochial schools. Well, Irish kids and Italian kids went to the same school. They fell in love. And then what do you have? World War II. Italian and Irish kids all going off to war. So when I grew up in the 50s, in the 60s, we used to make fun of each other, but there was nothing personal about it. But I, when I started writing my hit, histories with Al DePippo and interviewing people, um, the scars of that go very deep. Uh, and uh, uh, I grew up, uh, my uh, god, I had two sets of godparents. They, they were both Irish, so I knew nothing about this kind of tension. But if you talk to the old timers, it really it could be quite painful. Um, well, so with the census thing too, the reason why the, you don't have an accurate count was at that time when the Italians were asked questions, they were afraid to fill out the census or to converse <coughs> in their native language to an American, they thought they would be deported back to their homeland. So there wasn't a lot of information that was given at that time. Right. And in 1924, what had been cultural discrimination became part of government policy. Right. The Johnson Reed Act said no more Italians. We're going back to the 1890 census when there were no Italian, virtually no Italians here. So half, if half your family was in Italy and half the family was here, they, would be, they were separated for 40 years. And there was a tremendous fear of the immigration officer and you get deported. Right. Um, and then, and, and uh, that's important. I'm going to finish this, and I'm going to go to another uh, part that's going to be in next year's. So it's not going to be on Columbus Day next year. Maybe we'll have it a little bit later when people aren't out picking apples anymore. <laughs> uh, let's look at Tucko High School. Um, Tucko High School opens in 1931. Three high schools are built a mile and a half apart. Bronxville didn't even have a high school public high schools in 1925. Eastchester builds a high school, uh, first class 1929. They don't let anybody, you know, does anybody know the high school for Eastchester in Tuckahoe before 1929? Where's the old town hall, is it? Nope. No. Nope. New shop. Nope. No. Waverly School? Waverly School. Wow. It was Waverly School. So, then all of a sudden, the kids from Eastchester now, with the completion of the Bronx River Parkway, they can go 
to the new Eastchester High School. What about the poor kids from Tuckahoe? They got to go to Mount Vernon. They got to go to Yonkers. They have no place to go. So Tuckahoe gets together in June of 1929, and they pass a million dollar bond issue. And they pass, and, and that, by the way, Tuckahoe High School is on the National Register. What happens in October of 1929? Stop Tuckahoe's stuck with a million dollar high school and they have to pay for it. But Tuckahoe was very farsighted. They set up a mission statement and they hire a, a, a superintendent. Each other didn't even have a superintendent. They wouldn't do things the way they were. They, could, they felt they were better than everyone else. They just had principles. But Tuckahoe had a superintendent. And the unstated mission statement of the Tuckahoe schools was Americanizing the immigrant. And they did a good job of that. And Tuckahoe was becoming, unlike the rest of the country, a melting pot. There's no room for separate neighborhoods in Tuckahoe. Everybody had learned to live together. And uh, one of the places where they learned together, where the, where the, where the homework center, was uh, the Assumption Church. Uh, my mother-in-law was Jewish. Guess where the first synagogue was built? In Tuckahoe. Um, and uh, I told the story before, but it's a good story, so I'll tell it again. Uh, the story of Michael DePippo. I invited Al, we wrote a whole series of articles. But he had a, uh, Michael DePippo was one of the DePippos, and a lot of DePippos around. And Michael was a bad boy. He got in trouble with his teacher. And uh, the teacher, wasn't a very nice person. Annie Carapola went to school that day. She said to Miss Hayes. Now, Miss Hayes was cross-eyed. She would look at you like this out of the corner of her eye. Now, Annie said she was a nice lady. But you know, back then, if you misbehaved, you got punished. So she took off her belt and whipped uh, Michael DePippo. So he goes home to his parents with welts on his back. The parents go for the Agency for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. They take Miss Hayes and the school board to court. She's acquitted. And you know what her defense was? The population of my school is too cosmopolitan. What does that mean in English? Too many Italians and too many blacks. So there really wasn't. But then, for, for reasons, there was friction but not like the rest of the country. Now, um, um, so, and that was really to the credit of the school system and the people who ran Tuckahoe because the Klan did burn crosses in Tuckahoe in the 20s. I have a newspaper article that can prove it. But that friction that uh, uh, white supremacists always talk about didn't take place in Tuckahoe. It's a unique place. Um, now, Frank Uvino was the first person of Italian descent. It took 40 years to be elected mayor of Tuckahoe. Mr. Calavita, senior, I didn't put senior up there, becomes the first Italian supervisor of Italian descent in East Chester. And in 1974, guess when the first Columbus Day parade is? East Chester. East Chester. Now, I have a surprise for you. Next slide. Um, let me. Uh, where is that? Oh, here it is. Again, move your phone. So I've been getting phone calls over the summer from a woman named Simone Feroli. And she told me, I can trace my roots back to Tuckahoe in 1912. It was over the last nine years she's been writing a book about the Sanguina family. And I've been trying to trace. I don't know if anybody knows in Sanguinas. Sure, the dentist. Sanguina. Really? Yeah. We're going to talk afterwards. Wow. Um, yes. And, and, and uh, this book is in Italian, but there is an English translation. Um, and the book just came out. And if a few of you could, I don't, I have a bad short term memory. If you'd stand me, I want to take a picture and mail it to her. And, uh, and she's going to tell what it was like to grow up in Tucker. She's been doing nine years of research on this. Mm -hmm. I talk about her place. Um, in, uh, in southern Italy. Well, um, some winter I knew was went to uh, Iron Chat. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I think I had some winners in class, but I checked my. Uh, but but that, 
uh, and I know a lot about what it was like, so th this is going to be fascinating, um, and I'm going I'm to give it to some of the language teachers at Eastchester to, to translate for me, but I think it's already, but she wants pictures of you guys coming to see this. Uh, so this is a book, uh, I'll just pass this around, don't steal it, give it back to me. <laughs> Now, when you, I've done lots of oral histories. Um, Thank you. And uh, when you interview some families, it might be one, two, three people. But when you interview an Italian family, it might be anywhere from 10 to 20 people. And, yet, and usually, they give you a lot of good food, and they give you a lot of insights. Uh, my one of my favorite interviews is with uh, the Di Rienzo. Do you see the Samuel Di Lorenzo? Colonel Samuel Di Lorenzo, um, and, and I asked them uh, collectively, I said, how did you deal with all this uh, mistreatment? And Lester, you can read that to us. And this was her reply. We believed in the American dream. Even though Italians faced some discrimination, we found more opportunity than we left behind. Our dream was much bigger than the land we left behind. I think that's beautiful. Me uh, too. And, and that's important. And that's a real meaning of Columbus Day. That you came here, you didn't complain about what you didn't have. You took, you had gratitude by what you had, did have. All nine of the Di Riento, the father and the sons, uh, they, they were in banners all over the town showed their true love of this country. Now, every immigrant group and every group faces challenges. And they're different. The challenges the Italian faced were different than the Germans and the Irish and the African Americans. And every group handles it in a different way. I really don't know as much as I'd like to about the challenges that faced immigrants from Italy after 1965. It was different. And one of the things we like to do is, is not just talk about what the challenges were for Italians who came here later, and there were challenges. And, uh, um, and sometimes I would get really upset when I would hear people make negative comments about recent Italian immigrants. Um, and that's really, really important. But there's other groups in this town and one of the things we have to do is celebrate diversity because 51% of the people, this is a 2010 census, um, but I don't know, I, I think it hasn't changed much, but there are many new groups and it's important to celebrate diversity and not what we have that separates us and there are things that separate, but what, what we hold in common. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, any other comments? Questions? You know, the, the Italian people used to have their own languages sometimes, too. You know, like they would say basil would be called rosinigol. A dish towel would be called a mapin. <laughs> a, 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 a school of bast would be a strainer, they would call. A school of bast would be a strainer. So they made their own words as they, their own families. So when they bought different wording towards the American people, they would say, what are you talking about? Just like if you went to school, when I went to school when I was a ch young child, other kids would be eating peanut butter and jelly, the American dream. My mother would send us to school with peppers and eggs, and they thought that we came from Mars, <laughs> okay? Or she would send a small container, what we call a John Bort. It would be beans, it would be um, rice, carrots, and a piece of Italian bread. And they would look at us to say, what is that that you're reading? Are you reading goat <laughs> you know? So it was a different world back then. And the other thing I, just to um, continue talking, hey. the other thing is there are different dialects in Italy. Right. So a person from one part of Italy, southern Italy, couldn't talk to somebody right. in a village uh, 30 or 40 miles away because they right. talk differently. Right. You came from Rome. You, your dialect was different. If you came from Calabria, your dialect was different. There would be a couple of words that you would understand, but there wouldn't be, the, the, the dialect was quite different. I can't remember who, but was one of the presidents that were running for office and said, 
why do the Italians talk with their hands and not with their mouth as much, but they express themselves with their hands? And the president was told at that time they expressed themselves with, I believe, they expressed themselves with their hands, but they also expressed themselves with their words. And that's what's going to make our country great. And, you know, it was everybody that came here was a melting pot at one time. Whether you were black, whether you were Filipino, whether you were Irish American or Irish, or whether you were Italian descent or an Italian, you made this country what it is. And today, if they took all that constructive criticism that they're having today and put it together, I think we would have a better country than we're having right now. Don't forget the Germans and the French. Too. Right, right. The Germans and the French. Right. Yeah, we well, everybody, um, everybody faced barriers. Right. Everybody dealt with them differently. Right. Now, uh, I'm not going to whitewash it. If you were African American, you came here against your will. If you were right. Native American, there was a land grab. But it's important that we think what we uh, what we have in common, not what separates us. And uh, uh, um, we've suffered bad times before. The revolution was horrible. The Civil War, uh, 620,000 people died. It took decades for us to recover. After World War I, uh, uh, was horrible. Uh, when you think of the greatest generation, um, those guys who went out through the Depression in World War II, that was tough. I'm lucky. I was, I'm, I'm, I'm from the, the luckiest generation. Uh, we were born towards the end of World War II. We had everything going for us. When you? 1945. Yeah, I'm old. <laughs> I'm the oldest person in the room. <laughs> but it's, uh, but. Up till now, we've overcome every problem. But there is a resiliency about Americans that we have to treasure. And it's not that, and when I think about what I'm doing now, when I taught, I was teaching, we don't want to uh, repeat the mistakes of the past. Yeah, that's some truth to that, but you never know what's going to happen. What we really are teaching is about who we are and where we come from, and what are the traditions we should keep, and what are the traditions we should gradually change? And that's that's what keeps me going. Uh, when my son comes over at my house at night and Alexa comes over, you see me by the computer putting together this stuff. It, um, it, this is what make, keeps me ticking and it what makes America great. And I was at a, uh, a session on Wednesday night and people were complaining about the young kids. Oh, the young kids, you know, they're, they're in there, their cell phones. You know, are we setting a good example? For the young kids today, uh, and I, I would say no. You just listen to the news today. There's nothing good, uh, and we have to overcome that hatred. Uh, back in 1976, I went to a conference, and it started off with a cartoon we, from Pogo. We have met the enemy, and he is us. This country has kept a del. I'm sorry, I'm on a soapbox. Has kept a delicate balance between the blessings of liberty and the rule of law. And now it's being challenged again. And uh, in these presentations, and I'm going to put in a plug for the Eastchester Historical Society. We've been around since 1958 or 59, right, Lisa? Yeah, 58, 59. The charter yeah. was 50, 59, but they had organized in 1958. And yeah. Lisa's been working day and night for the last 10 days and putting together a new website. Our, our website needs a lot of updating, so we were able to hire a web designer, and I'm doing all the writing for it so you can complain to me if it's not real well written. <laughs> um, I'm not insulted. Uh, so we hope to have it up and running before the end of the school year. And I know many of you know, but I always try to repeat this little story. We have been, we suffered, all suffered from the pandemic, but we loaned our grounds, Marble Schoolhouse, to the Chester Heights Fire Department, and they have not given it back yet. And we really think the town should be recognizing that what we've given up and just saying thank you. And we hope to get our school back also before the end of the year. That's our marble schoolhouse. So um, you have to talk to Tony Colavia, just tell him, when are you letting that school, those people back into their home? <laughs> we're, we're homeless at the, the moment. The uh, East Chester Fire Department, it's called the East Chester Fire Department, and Engine 30, is the, that's the home of Chester Heights. They're working diligently in there to 
make that house come back to life and have that engine company be back in there. So I would say closely before the first of the year that would happen. You know, they ran into a lot of barriers. They found asbestos in the walls and a lot of things have happened. They put a brand new water line in and the water line crank cracked and they had to do that again. There's a lot of flooding in the basement. But I, I think we'll, your, the engine company will be back in Chester Heights and I think your school house will be back to normalization soon. Thank you. We would just like a little more recognition for, about about what we've done. That's well, I, 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 I live in Chester Heights and I speak about it. If you Thank watch you. some of the meetings, Thank I do talk much. about your you know, the two people want to get back in, and those firefighters want to get back. I, into I know their they want to get out, believe me. They want to get back into their quarters because they're in that small back room back it, there. It's over two years we've been homeless. Right. That's a long time to not have your organization have a home. Right. But you got to realize a lot of things were done with band aids, they weren't done properly. So now I think it's going in the right direction. Well, we stepped up when nobody else could, so that's, that's right. the thing that we that's just, it, yeah. yeah, and that's people, the thing we want to right. make known to right. the community. The people of Chester Heights are very lucky that you did step up to them because that engine yeah. company would have probably been up at Waverly. <laughs> the only when it gets cold, the engine has to go to Waverly because <laughs> the tank will, will uh, freeze and, yeah. and burst. We're, we're happy tank. to do it. You yes. have to understand that. Right. Right. But my, anyway, my, Anne Marie, my, I know you. Sorry, I, I just have a question. Um, some of the previous slides, the one where San Francisco had the first Columbus Day. What attracted, I'm assuming there was a large Italian population in San Francisco for that to happen. What was the attraction for them to travel across the country at that time? I'm guessing, I don't know what much, but Italians loved to fish and the fishing industry was very big there. And I'm just guessing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you uh, and in New England, the fishermen were already there. Yeah. San Francisco was just developing, and it was a, a burgeoning community. Um, so so it's, it's a great history. And I'll tell you, when I was asked to put this together, I learned a lot about my heritage. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, we have great organizations in town, Italian-American organizations. Um, my father was not proud of the fact that he was Italian, and he joined a lot of people. Like, look at all the singers that changed their names. Dean Martin. Uh, Tony Bennett. Tony Bennett. But not Frank Sinatra. He was always proud of being Italian. Uh, so th that's important. And uh, we have great civic, uh, civic Italian, we have three or four Italian American clubs in town. I guess the Generational Pope Foundation has opened up the game. So it's important to celebrate your heritage, where you came from. I, I didn't do that with my family. I'm beginning to do it now. Well, I think back to the day that um, they wanted to assimilate so badly that they didn't embrace their heritage. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm mixed. I'm Italian, German, Irish, and I've learned a lot. My grandmother had a tremendous oral history that she shares with me, and I've shared that with several cousins, Italian cousins, that I've met through Ancestry.com. And they're just amazed at how much I knew. And, um, you know. When, when you study the history of Italy, the one country in Europe after the Holocaust that, and they, it was a fascist country that took in, uh, they took in people, uh, Jewish victims, the most open were the Italians. Well, what did they do to Mussolini at the world? Well, during World War II, they hung on his boots. They dragged him through the streets like they should have. And the one thing, and, and, and Tony Colavino, when he makes this speech, talks about uh, the uh, the importance of family in this town. Mm -hmm. And we have, if you want to pick up a copy of the uh, Eastchester Covenant, signed by the 10 fa farm families. Lisa, you, you yeah, mentioned they're, that. Yeah, they're back there, yeah. Uh, so, uh, now, we, are, we have a lot to do with the freedoms and the Bill of Rights, but really, what really makes us unique is that covenant saying that the people of this town will be compassionate and honest, and compassionate and Italian run hand in hand. Tony Colavita is one of the reasons why I'm still living in East Chester. When he's gone, I'm gone. <laughs> he's the best supervisor of this town. Well, yeah, if you look at him and his father, uh, this is a well-run town. Tony Junior, the current supervisor, he's a good man. Yeah. Well, we've got other supervisors, but he's a good man. Uh, uh, 
And I'm going to say only good things about Tony Calavita because I'm hot. Every year I have to go out for reappointment from him. I can't think of anything. I can't think of anything. Very bad. Nice to me. I can't think of anything bad to say about him. I don't want to jump back a minute. Are you talking about people not being proud of their uh, Italian heritage? Yeah. That's not why they changed their names. They changed their names because of discrimination. That's why they changed their names. You're probably right. It wasn't the question of being proud. Yeah, if, you, if you had an Italian, you were discriminated against. Let me tell you a quick story. Well, that's why I was telling the story of Phil White. Uh, my, my family, back in the early 1900s, had a business in the Bronx, and most of the cops were Irish at that time, and they did not like Italians, and they broke my family's coolones big time. They were picked on. Not besides having to deal with the mafia trying to move in on the business. Right, so you can tell me My family knows all about discrimination. You can tell me afterwards what, the, what that means in Italian. Okay. Yeah, everybody <laughs> knows. <laughs> no, I don't. I know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, that's what made my marriage last for uh, this is a great, 50, this is a great town. 50, 40. Well, it's a great, I love living here. I grew up in Pelham, and I like each other better. But uh, I, one town. last joke, and then I'm going to stop because I know you're running out to the parade. Um, I always used to tell my friends, we love playing East Chester in sports because you had beautiful girls and you were an easy win. <laughs> uh, that's how we, uh, and they couldn't get mad at me because their wives were there. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.